Hello, this is Mark Sobel, U.S. Chair of OMFIF. Today, OMFIF and I have the great pleasure and honor of hosting this year's public launch of the IMF's External Sector Report. The IMF, the External Sector Report is one of the IMF's flagship documents, along with the World Economic Outlook, Global Financial Stability Report, and Fiscal Monitor. The so-called ESR was started in 2012 and in recent years has become an eagerly anticipated IMF document. The IMF is charged with the task of promoting global growth, balanced trade, orderly exchange arrangements, and the smooth functioning of the international monetary system. It seeks to do so through its bilateral and multilateral surveillance, lending, and technical assistance. Its ESR work on global imbalances and exchange rates is a critical component of the fund's multilateral surveillance. Assessing the domestic and external roots of global imbalances and exchange rate valuations, no matter how difficult an undertaking, is a necessary and essential task for the IMF. To do so, the ESR must rely significantly on lag data, mainly 2019 in this case, in offering external assessments. But for the document to be timely as always, it must also address the present and look to the future. That means that writing this year's report was especially challenging given the unknowable and uncertain economic ramifications of the pandemic. Yet this year's ESR has masterfully met these enormous challenges with an excellent assessment of external positions and an outstanding discussion of the risks posed by the coronavirus. It makes for an excellent read and that owes much to Gita Gopinath and Daniel Lee. Gita will lead us off reviewing the ESR's main findings. Gita needs no introduction. She is director of the IMS research department and the fund's chief economist. She, became, she came to the fund from Harvard where she established herself as a world-renowned international macroeconomist known for her cutting edge work on exchange rate theory. I also wanna commend Daniel Lee the division chief in the research department's open economy macro section, who led the talented fund staff in preparing this year's ESR. He is well known as well, in particular for his work with Olivier Blanchard on post-global financial crisis fiscal multipliers. After the presentation, there will be three discussions. I will offer some remarks, followed by Catherine Mann and Daniel Gross. Kathy Mann is chief economist at Citigroup, and before that, the OECD's chief economist. She's had a long distinguished career as a professor, a scholar at the Peterson Institute, staff member at the Federal Reserve. She is a thought leader on balance of payments, capital flows, and currencies. Daniel Gross is director of the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. He's written extensively about EU economic policy, including the impact of the Euro on European and capital, on European capital and labor markets, and the international role of the Euro and global imbalances. After the discussion, I'll open the floor to some lead off questioners and then to the audience with the remaining time. I thank listeners for joining and you can submit questions on the chat function. Gita, the floor is yours. And again, I commend you and your entire team for an excellent report. And it is an honor to be joined by you and Daniel today. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and uh, thanks to you know, especially on Fafen Yu for uh, hosting this, uh, this panel discussion. Uh, I also want to just reiterate what you said about Daniel. Daniel has been really the instrumental, the main person behind putting this report together. He deserves just much of the credit and he and his team. Uh, so let me jump in. Um, you can see my slides. So let me just walk through them. So, so let's just get started here. So, as you know, as Mark said, uh, this report uh, examines uh, external imbalances uh, of countries. That is their external account, their external positions with respect to the rest of the world. Uh, and in this particular report, uh, we've uh, made three main uh, contributions. The first is to assess countries' external positions in 2019. 
Uh, the second is to, uh, to determine what this crisis is doing to countries' external positions. Now, of course, that's highly uncertain, and we are in the, we are, this is in the forecasting stage, and therefore preliminary, but it's important for us to share those insights with you. And third is on what this implies for uh, required policies. So what this uh, first slide uh, tells you, of course, is the fact that external imbalances exist. And you can see that in the graph. You saw that they grew particularly big before the global financial crisis, and they came down quite significantly after the global financial crisis. However, since then, they've remained uh, quite stable. And now our current account deficit and surplus is a problem. The answer is, of course, not always, because there are very good reasons why countries should be running surpluses and deficits. If you are a country with an aging population, these, the people should be saving, uh, and you should expect those countries to have uh, larger surpluses. On the other hand, if you're a country that has a young population, is a dynamic, growing economy that requires a lot of investment, then that's a country that would be running deficits. At the same time, when these deficits get too large, they could uh, signal uh, risks. Uh, if you're a country that has a very large uh, deficit and relying heavily on foreign, on foreign borrowing, then any changes in global market sentiment, for instance, could jeopardize your ability to uh, refinance yourself, and that could trigger a crisis. So there are many examples of that in history. The goal of the ESR is to systematically assess the external positions of the world's 30 largest economies uh, and to basically highlight potential risks that countries need to address uh, jointly. So the question is determining when these balances, both on the surplus side and on the deficit side, are larger or in excess of what is warranted. And that is a difficult task. So let me show you here this graph, which is the, uh, our assessments for uh, 2019. Uh, we take a very holistic approach when you're looking at uh, the external positions of countries. We have the external balance assessment model, the EBA model that we use. Uh, but we also look at many other factors like a country's net investment, foreign investment, international investment position, uh, the nature of the capital flows into the economy, the amount of foreign exchange reserves the country has. So using a holistic approach, uh, which combines the model, the EBA model, but also the IMF staff assessments, uh, we come up with a measure of what we call current account gaps. So now what exactly is a current account gap? The idea here is to take a country's actual current account to remove the component that is purely transitory or and cyclical, and to look at whether the remaining component is in line with domestic fundamentals and desired policies. And if it is in line with it, then it's called broadly in line, and you see that in the middle of the graph. Those are the countries for whom we assess that the gap is broadly in line with uh, fundamentals and desired policies. But then there are countries that we determine have moderately stronger or stronger or even substantially stronger current accounts relative to this norm. Uh, as, and there are the countries on the other side of the spectrum where it's kind of moderately weaker uh, or weaker, which means that their current accounts are you know, lower than warranted by uh, fundamentals and uh, desired policies. So let me just give you a couple of examples uh, if you look at the left, uh, in the case of that, you can see the US is in the moderately weaker category, which is that it's a country whose current account uh, deficit uh, is, is larger than what the norm would uh, say it should be. On the other hand, if you look at towards the right, you can see, for instance, uh, you know, Germany and Netherlands, uh, those are countries where the current account deficits are determined to be substantially bigger. Uh, what you can see here is that in recent times, the deficits in surplus countries have tended to be um, in the uh, advanced economies. So again, deficits US, UK, Canada, surplus uh, in the sense of larger than 
than the norm is Germany, Netherlands, and, and there are some countries in Asia too, so you're Singapore and Thailand. So you have uh, countries uh, that we then put on the scale and we, uh, we do these assessments as well we do on a, on a yearly basis. So I think a question to ask is, how have these assessments for 2019 changed relative to what we had for 2018? So on the left graph is the, our assessment of the current account. On the right-hand side is assessment of the real effective exchange rate gaps. Um, so what you see here on the left-hand graph is that uh, there is a qu quite a bit of heterogeneity. So you have some countries where you have some uh, more substantial changes as opposed to uh, others. Uh, uh, on the other hand, if you look to a uh, right-hand graph, you see the same figure, but for in terms of uh, real effective exchange rates. So just looking at the two figures together, what you see is that countries that uh, are, you know, have larger uh, current account uh, surplus gaps uh, are ones also that tend to have uh, or undervalued uh, exchange rates. On the other hand, countries that have more uh, kind of bigger current account deficit gaps, those are the ones that tend to have more overvalued exchange rates. So they line up, they don't line up perfectly, but you do see uh, the relationship as one might uh, expect. Now, if you look at this uh, crisis, what you see, uh, now, I'm, now I'm looking forward, I'm looking at, um, for 2020 uh, and just uh, you know, thinking about how this particular COVID-19 uh, crisis is impacting uh, uh, these external balances. So of course this crisis has been first and foremost a health crisis, massive increase uh, in you know, infections and cases around the world that still has not abated. Uh, alongside we have seen with the great lockdown, we've seen a collapse in global trade. And this is our projection for 2020 of negative 12%. We've had episodes of deep financial stress that happened particularly in March, but then has since abated quite significantly thanks to generous policy support around the world. Uh, and then there's also been a collapse in energy prices, which then has recovered some, but it's still well below the pre-crisis levels. Tourism has fallen off the cliff. So countries that rely on tourism are more dramatically impacted by this crisis. And similarly, remittances uh, have fallen. So if you're a country that relies quite heavily on uh, oil exports, or if a country that relies very heavily on tourism or on remittances, you have a very large shock to your uh, fi financing of your current account. What we also did see uh, from uh, during this period was large swings in currencies. And so this is a graph here where you can see in green, the movement in the exchange rate uh, between kind of February 19th and March 16th. So it's a fairly short period of time, but about a month around then. Uh, and you saw that the typical uh, reserve currencies on the left, the US dollar, the Euro, the yen, the Swiss franc, they appreciated relative to others. And then you had other countries and, uh, and particularly oil exporters, for instance, Colombia, that you see the green bar with a very large uh, depreciation. Uh, but again, you see that for, for other countries, Mexico, for South Africa, you see big, uh, Russia, you see big depreciations. Now, after the very substantial policy support that came from central banks around the world, uh, particularly, you've seen a, a marked improvement in financial sentiment and you did see sharp reversals in those depreciations. So for instance, if you look at Colombia again, you see the, you know, the green bar almost being offset by the blue in a portion, which is basically telling how much appreciation there has been since uh, March uh, until now in the Colombian peso. Uh, and similarly, you see that, you see a lot of blue bars in the appreciation territory uh, and you've seen, but it's not, a, it's not all, not all countries have benefited from that uh, improvement in my, my sentiment. Uh, however, you've definitely seen a, a reversal. So the question is, what do we think of the consequences of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic for current account uh, balances? It, it is a mixed picture. 
And remember, these are forecasts. This is not what we actually see because balance of payment data comes with a lag. So these are our forecasts uh, for 2020. It's going to depend on uh, the particular country's circumstances, how much they rely on commodity exports, how much they rely on tourism, and how much they, how much they rely on remittances, for instance, will play a very important role. So you can see here uh, on in this graph, if you look at the current account, for instance, of Saudi Arabia in 2019 or Russia in 2019, and if you compare to what's the current on, on your y-axis, the current account change, what it's telling you is that major commodity exporters should see their current accounts going from significant surpluses to significant uh, deficits. And you can see that particularly of Saudi Arabia, projections are to go from 6% of a surplus to negative 11% in 2020. Similarly, surplus countries like Thailand and Malaysia that rely heavily on tourism are also now expected projected to be in deficit in 2020, uh, uh, owing also to the fall in tourism uh, revenues. On the other hand, you see some countries uh, that started off in a deficit in 2019. So for instance, India, you can see that to the left of the zero line. Uh, and you also can um, see that for some, for some other countries there, South Africa, for instance. I mean, those are also countries that rely on uh, you know, oil imports. And, and, and these countries, you see that we are projecting uh, an improvement in their current account. So instead of having a deficit in 2019, you get a surplus uh, in 2020. Now, what do we uh, think is globally the impact on current account balances? Uh, on uh, the left graph, you have the period of the global, just before and after the global financial crisis, 2007, 08, 09. And you see the significant narrowing of current account deficits and surpluses that we saw between 2008 and 2009. On the right hand, you see the, uh, the current years, 2018, 2019, and our projection for 2020. Uh, an important difference is that while we are expecting some narrowing of current account deficits and surpluses in 2020, overall, it's a much smaller change relative to uh, the global financial crisis. So why is that? Now, there are a few factors for it. One, of course, that the starting points are very different. Uh, in 2008 and 2007, just the size of these, account, these imbalances were much bigger than they are uh, now. And so because of that, the changes, of course, are just in terms of the numbers are going to be smaller. But that's not the only story, because in the global financial crisis, the problem was of some countries, some large deficit countries like the US uh, that had asset bubbles and large investments that preceded the collapse. Uh, and as the bu bubbles burst, you saw an unwinding of an investment uh, and that led to uh, uh, kind of a, a, sh a shrinking of the deficit. So those movements were there. This time around, of course, you have what you have is a health crisis. Uh, it's global. Uh, and which and every almost all countries in the world, every country in the world is undertaking expansionary uh, fiscal policy. So what we are seeing here is you do see commodity exporters projected to have smaller surpluses, as I showed you in the previous graph too. But there are a lot of countries that are, on the one hand, the governments are engaging are engaging in more spending, so there's less public sector saving, uh, but that is being offset by more precautionary saving from the private sector. So on net, uh, we are seeing smaller movements in, in the current account. Now, again, I cannot reiterate this enough. This is a crisis that has not ended. We're still in the middle of it and there, are, there is tremendous uncertainty uh, going forward. And this rift also has obviously implies that our projections are subject to tremendous uncertainty. The risks, are. Uh, are elevated, they remain. We are seeing outbreaks reappear, second rounds of outbreaks reappear around the world. Those could further intensify uh, and could trigger a tightening of financial conditions, which would be uh, particularly problematic at a time when global debt levels are at historic highs. Now, of course, there could be positive news too, which is what we've also seen recently about uh, you know, the faster developments of treatments and vaccines, 
uh, and that could improve uh, conditions and include, including financial conditions further. Uh, there are uh, the risk of uh, trade tensions, and, and we've also seen that arise. Uh, this is a crisis that's leading to a lot of uh, nationalism and protectionism. Uh, we've, uh, uh, you know, we could see erosion of cross-border integration value chains. And the longer this crisis uh, continues, there would be a desire for greater precautionary savings. People want to save more, particularly in countries where the safety nets are insufficient. And, uh, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, we, this crisis has called for significant spending. So fiscal imbalances will grow and debt levels will grow. So let me end with my last slide, which is on uh, policies. Uh, we have split that up into near term policies and what's required in the medium term. In the near term, of course, the health crisis is not over. If we need a sustainable recovery, the health crisis will have to be addressed front and center. So it is important for countries to focus on health uh, and provide relief to their people. Of countries uh, that have have that have flexible exchange rates have benefited from the in you know the uh, the insulation that's provided, especially for commodity exporters. You've seen large movements in the exchanges as it should be, and that's helped them uh, deal with the shock. Now, in some cases, when there is uh, there are disorderly market conditions, the market failures, uh, and countries that, for instance, have mismatches on their balance sheets. Uh, in the sense of having large amounts of foreign currency debt, uh, in those countries, FX intervention in disorderly market conditions can play a role in a, on a temporary basis. Now, while we've seen an improvement, broad-based improvement in financing conditions since March for several emerging markets, it's not universal. There are countries that still have uh, tight financial conditions, quite tight financial conditions, and do not have access uh, to market financing on favorable terms. In that case, official financing will have to play an important role. It is what we're doing at the IMF. Swap lines will have to play a very important role to ensure that there is uh, reserve currency liquidity. Uh, many Fed reserves, including US Fed, have played a very important role there. Uh, it is essential for countries to avoid putting on tariffs. And this is particularly problematic when you've seen it happen for medical exports. Uh, this, is, this is not in the interest of the world. It should not be done. Um, uh, more generally, tariffs that have been recently put in place should be unwound. As, and that applies also for not putting in place non-tariff barriers. Uh, the multilateral trading system needs more work. It absolutely needs uh, to be modernized. Uh, it needs to to you know uh, address issues of uh, services trade, uh, e-commerce issues of intellectual property rights, subsidies, and so on. But it has to be done uh, on a on an international basis, on a multilateral basis, through cooperation and setting of new rules. Uh, on the medium term, uh, countries. Uh, came into this crisis with imbalances. So clearly there are structural issues, there are fundamentals uh, that precede this crisis that set these countries up for larger than desired surpluses or deficits. And once this crisis abates, that has to be uh, uh, addressed. If the pre-crisis imbalances persist, uh, there are things countries can do. Excess deficit countries, for example, could reform their policies to ensure fiscal sustainability. In some countries, the problem is not fiscal, but it's about a lack of export competitiveness and efforts should be made to improve that. Uh, in the case of excess surplus countries, you need to undertake in some cases reforms to encourage investment. In other cases, the problem is that in the absence of adequate social safety nets, there's excess savings by households and so putting in place the right safety nets would also help uh, discourage uh, precautionary savings. So these are the policies that need to be uh, undertaken. Uh, with that, I am going to stop and, uh, and conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that excellent presentation, Gita.
um, let me kick off uh, the discussion. Um, and I should say that though I left government service a few years ago, my thinking about the global imbalances and exchange rate uh, questions is still influenced by my many years as a U.S. international financial official. And I think, as you pointed out, there are so many concerning global risks now that it's hard to do justice to any of them. Debt loads and distress, trade protectionism, anemic subpar growth, which the crisis will only worsen, populism, etc. So I thought I'd comment on a risk directly relevant to the IMF, which underscores the ESR's importance, and that is currency protectionism. So uh, the IMF was created against the backdrop of the 1930s and the desire of Bretton Woods conference participants to avoid a return to beggar than neighbor currency policies and a bilateralization of exchange rate disputes. But currency protectionism has been a real threat and problem throughout. Uh, there were rows in the 1960s as the Bretton Woods system tottered. There were rows in the 80s around the Plaza Accord when the U.S. ran a significantly imbalanced policy mix that drove up the dollar and fostered uh, trade protectionist pressures. There were huge problems uh, between 2000 and 2014, let's say, with Chinese exchange rate practices when China ran massive current account surpluses with corresponding intervention. And beyond China, and it's still hefty $140 billion surplus, though small relative to GDP, several other Asian economies, including Taiwan, which often intervene heavily, uh, have a surplus of around $180 billion, which isn't jump change. There's the curious case of Germany uh, and its world beating 7% of GDP, nearly $300 billion surplus, in which uh, despite no national currency, excess national saving has absorbed European and global demand for many years. Um, and as your charts showed, uh, there are issues about the size of current account surpluses and their excesses with the Netherlands and uh, Switzerland. Um, you know, on the theme of uh, currency tensions, uh, when the United States pursued quantitative easing after the global financial crisis, there was a cry of currency wars, absurd in my view, but emerging markets complained that QE pushed the dollar down. Well, frankly, I felt they were silently praying for more US growth, which was precisely the purpose of QE. And countries always decry the dollar's so-called exorbitant privilege. Currency disputes and protectionism can spill over into trade protectionism. The administration errantly designated China for currency manipulation last year as a trade deal was being bickered um, about. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't sharply criticize, as the ESR rightly does, the administration's ruling to treat currency undervaluation as a countervailable subsidy. Currency undervaluation can't be precisely measured. Exchange rates reflect macro policy and capital flows, not just trade. Undervaluation could be the flip side of US policies or market sentiment causing dollar overvaluation. It's really not at all feasible to extract a bilateral equilibrium exchange rate from a multilateral calculation, and the rule is likely WTO inconsistent. So my country is at times wrongly politicized exchange rates. As much as past treasuries sought to fend off currency protectionism, Congress and others over time have blamed currency movements when the US was really coping with technological change, globalization, unemployment, or poor macro policy. But it's also true that other countries have sought to promote undervalued currencies through intervention. They've built up excessive reserves. They've relied on the US as the importer of first and last resort for export led growth strategies. And so that brings me back to the ESR and the IMF. Global imbalances have sharply declined since the global financial crisis, as you showed. Uh, China's whopping surplus is now small relative to GDP and China has ceased intervention. Booming US energy production has kept America's current account deficit in check. Germany's surplus still stands out like a sore thumb, though its post-crisis fiscal policy may slightly reduce it, but we can't be complacent. Savings and investment imbalances will be with us after the crisis. Excess current account surpluses and deficits and over and undervalued currencies and currency misalignments are and will still be serious issues. 
at times mirroring major economic distortions which undermine the global outlook. Further, after the global financial crisis, we saw a jump in protectionist pressure that only worsened with the current administra US administration. We saw a surge in global populism and inequality. And we may well face such surges again in the post-virus period as the recovery may entail worsening inequality, high unemployment, and enormous dislocations in economic structures. So the IMF doesn't have the WTO's mandate on fighting trade protectionism, but it is mandated to lead on the front lines of repelling currency protectionism. The fund has substantially enhanced its exchange rate analysis with the ESR. It may well need to build on the ESR and use ruthless truth telling and its bully pulpit to help the international community resist the risk of future currency protectionism. Um, let me just wrap up with a question for Gita. So in the board, um, when I was there, I twice asked Maury Opsfeld a question and both times he wiggled out from giving an answer. So I'm gonna visit Maury Sins on you today. Um, so we know the dollar is the world's reserve and financial currency because we have a large US economy, the deepest and most liquid capital markets in the world, they're open, we have good protections for property and plus zero network and inertial effects. Um, now, the fund's ESR model includes a reserve variable, which pushes the U.S. current account deficit, um, the U.S. current account norm considerably in the deficit direction. I think 3% of GDP is a number I last remembered. So I believe the dollar's global role is a net benefit to America, uh, but it comes uh, with costs reflected in persistent current account deficits, uh, which can have implications for domestic jobs and growth. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've heard others complain about the dollar's exorbitant privilege. That goes back to the French in the 1960s, uh, before you were born. So my question, more than 50 years later, is if the dollar's privilege is so exorbitant and others are still complaining about it, why is it that nobody else ever seems to want a piece of the action? Over to you, Kathy. Ah, well, um, I'm not sure I can top the piece of the action part, um, it, but it's, you know, that has been a systematic question and um, I will make some reference. Um, I've been asked to, to comment on current account uh, deficit countries uh, in, my, in my remarks. But before I do, um, you know, I think that when we look at something like this report, as with the other IMF reports, the systematic presentation of the wealth of information is something that uh, really represents a public good. Uh, there is no way that, that um, individuals uh, can amass this type of information. And, and how you put it together um, it, you know, with, a, with a point of view, that's, that's of course something that's very important, but the underpinnings, the fundamentals that um, you provide to researchers around the world to um, do their own assessment of what these uh, indicators mean. Uh, I think that that is really something that is extremely valuable. Um, and of course, un unfortunately for this report, you had to kind of write two of them, the pre-COVID report and then the after-COVID report. And that just adds, uh, adds a, a, an extra dimension of, of the challenges. Um, the, the second version, the second version of it, the post-COVID uh, sort of the, or the within, uh, during COVID, COVID times part of the report, is an important comment though, to the degree to which uh, COVID has created uh, a, a heterogeneity in impact across countries. Um, you've emphasized it in the context of tourism and remittances, uh, di very differential impacts um, requiring new assessments. Uh, you know, we all kind of have oil in the background. We've, we've been through lots of different oil cycles, uh, but these uh, in terms of tourism and, and remittances are really new, something that we also have focused on in our own work um, at City. Uh, this, this macro aggregate uh, underpinnings to the excess current accounts and the partner of uh, real exchange rate over or undervaluation. Of course, those are quite similar. They have the similar underpinnings to them. I would find it extraordinarily odd 
if um, current account uh, de deviations from sort of current account equilibrium and deviations from the real exchange rate equilibrium, if they did not move together, I would think it was extraordinarily odd. So they both sort of line up along uh, along uh, uh, the unitary line when you do a scatter plot. So I'm not surprised about that, um, but it might be interesting to focus a little bit more on on the deviations. You know, the ones that are that are not so close to the line. What is what is true about that? But um, keeping with this theme of um, really thinking about differentiation and heterogeneity, and I think this is particularly important because one of the consequences of presenting a, a, on a, an aggregate, a, a sort of a macro level assessment of nets, meaning the current account balance is a net, um, and inter, you know, using something like international reserves as, a, as an important input to that, um, the uh, you know there there are um, there are shall we say uh, certain users of these indicators that um, take the numbers not the range but the numbers uh, as kind of truth and a benchmark against what which one should make investment decisions uh, financial investment decisions. And when it's at the macro level, uh, and we are in an environment where heterogeneity in terms of uh, the COVID consequences is so great, there's a, there's a, there's a potential tension between using a macro-based benchmark indicator. And I'm not saying that they should be doing that, but, but, but they are. Um, you know, there's only one number or so that you can get in an algo. Um, and so you end up with... Um, the question of whether or not a macro indicator is really going to be telling you the right story for how uh, investment decisions should be made. We know that investment decisions are made based on single indicators or, or a set of macro indicators. And I think one of the things where, where examples where you show this is on the evaluation of the EM long position since 2004. We can discuss a lot about whether or not uh, that type of um, excess uh, holding of international reserves represents protection for an economy or not. But in the research uh, that you note in the report, um, you know, 50, 45% uh, of uh, capital flows in emerging markets were related to VIX. Um, now that's either a half full, half full or half empty statement. You know, half of it was related to VIX and did not take account of the uh, heterogeneity of the COVID consequences or you can say, you know, half of it did. Um, but it, it suggests that there is a sense in which these um, systematic strategies of assessing current account uh, imbalances uh, can be um, used, uh, depended on uh, too much by um, those types of investment strategies that want to simplify and aggregate. Uh, and in a case like COVID, crisis and the heterogeneity of consequences, perhaps that gives us uh, a bit and takes us a bit in the wrong direction. Um, so I was asked particularly to comment on um, the current account deficit economies and uh, what we think about that. Um, first, of course, I think the first point is the persistence in this current account deficit uh, situation. Um, uh, that persistence may be due to the exorbitant privilege as, as Mark says. Um, but it over, clearly has been overlaid by a variety of policy issues as well. So let's talk about the pathways to adjustment and what some of the issues might be. And let me talk a little bit about the um, pathways to adjustment that are suggested in the report. So we first, of course, have to start with if the pathway to adjustment in the short term is a reduction in a current account imbalance on account of you know, demand compression, uh, the collapse in consumer um, uh, you know, income and business investment. Clearly, we don't really want to have that persist. Um, so that's, that's not a good adjustment. Um, you're also, uh, the report also argues that the current account um, imbalance and the adjustment is going to be less, or would be suggested to be less than during the GFC. I wonder whether we should be looking at that uh, imbalance adjustment, which is the net, or whether we should be focusing on how trade, gross trade, 
exports and imports, the two components, plus we have some income we could discuss, but exports and imports, that gross adjustment may be, in our view, uh, and looking at the data, that gross adjustment in trade is greater than during the GFC. And what do we think about that? It's not the imbalance, it's the gross adjustment in trade flows and how that might persist going forward as under the rubric of your precautionary savings, I flip that on its head and say, business investment in, in real, you know, real business investment, it's precautionary savings. I'm gonna keep cash on my balance sheet if I'm a business. Um, I'm gonna engage in a lot of financial market, uh, uh, you know, uh, activities using that cash. Um, but that to my mind on a real side represents a collapse in business investment. And that has both medium term consequences, well, short term and medium term consequences for trade flows because capital is such a uh, supply chain intensive activity. But it also has very uh, important consequences in the longer term because the collapse in business investment, the associated collapse in gross trade flows which as you know, uh, in the report, you know, trade has been um, on the back foot for a decade. That uh, collapse in, in gross trade flows, the collapse in business investment, uh, the use of the precautionary savings at the corporation, at the corporate level, being a uh, M&A, buybacks, dividends, et cetera, not for business investment. That has very long-term consequences for productivity and for debt sustainability. So we can talk about those things in more depth, um, but I will leave it at that. Thank you for those excellent remarks. Daniel Gross, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to comment on this report, uh, which you and Catherine already mentioned is really a benchmark for many of us out there in the world trying to understand where the global economy is heading. My reading would be that it is actually pretty much good news. Uh, this crisis uh, was not caused by global imbalances, was also not caused by financial imbalances, as Gita already said. Um, and the real question was whether from a starting point of already, let's say, moderating global imbalances, things would get slightly better or worse. And uh, I take Gita's presentation as saying it will get slightly better. Uh, she showed already a pretty strong correlation between current accounts and the change in the current accounts, so which would imply that global current account imbalance would be reduced. And that even I think would have been better if she had showed it the relationship between uh, the difference between the global uh, account norm, current account norm, and the actual change. Uh, but here again, I see good news. If I take the four countries with the highest uh, excess current account with respect to the norm, uh, which were the Netherlands, Germany, Singapore, and Thailand, they all predicted to have a reduced current account surplus. And I would say, therefore, overall, we should see a little bit of reduction and especially a reduction in the current account surpluses of the, say, most uh, strongest uh, countries with the strongest current account surpluses for one simple reason. Uh, some of these countries are also the ones which have the strongest fiscal position, and therefore they can allow themselves also the strongest fiscal reaction, uh, which should uh, keep their own consumption up, imports up, whereas uh, their exports uh, might be somewhat limited uh, by the global slump uh, uh, in, in trade and activity. And let me just add uh, one thing on uh, globalization and the outlook for trade. I'm less pessimistic perhaps uh, than Catherine and the others. Uh, I must see, I don't see a globalized race towards protectionism outside perhaps of the strictly medical sector. I think Donald Trump has given tariffs a very bad image. And I think very few countries are looking forward uh, to imitating his path. 
Um, and uh, there are, of course, some contingent reasons why in the very short run we see a collapse in services trade tourism. Gita showed how tourism has really collapsed. Uh, the oil price itself will lead to a measured slump in trade because if you exchange the same amount of oil at half the price, uh, then, of course, uh, measured world trade is reduced. But uh, once we take these factors out, um, I don't really see a big sign that there has been a strong impact on, let's say, trade in manufacturing goods. And uh, I would also submit, as I said earlier, that the medium term outlook is not that bad. Of course, everything subject to a satisfactory so so uh, evolution of the medical crisis. Uh, if we don't get the virus under control, we can't get the economy under control and trade uh, will suffer. That is quite clear. But overall, I would say external imbalances are not the one thing that policymakers should worry about most at this point in time. Well, thank you for that, uh, Daniel. Um, Gita, uh, we've uh, made a few provocative remarks. Um, would you like to respond to anything you've heard? Uh, yes, indeed. Thank you. These are very interesting remarks. And uh, I wanted to respond to a couple, including to your uh, uh, pointed question. You might arrive at the same conclusion about my response as, as you did on Maury's, but I'm going to try. <laughs> try. On the question of uh, if it's so wonderful to be uh, the dominant currency of the world and to have the exorbitant privilege, why doesn't somebody else want a piece of the action? Right? I think that was your question. Uh, to that, I would say that to me, I do think that many countries want a piece of the action. But of course, trying to get to that point requires certain measures that are not that easy to, to, to implement. So let me be clear. So for instance, I think the, uh, the Euro has clearly been now, and now a push for making the Euro uh, much more of uh, an international dominant currency. There is uh, uh, you know, the talk of the renminbi potentially playing that role at some point. But again, as you mentioned, that these positions can be entrenched because there are strong network effects over here. Uh, but also, it has to be a country that has all the right amount of uh, fundamentals in terms of very deep financial markets, uh, very good, strong financial institutions. Uh, if you think of uh, China, there is a long way to go on those fronts. Uh, in the case of the Euro area, there is the question of when will there be deep markets for Euro safe assets uh, and that there is a distance to go on that front. So I think there is a, a desire for it. Uh, that said, I think the point is that this is by when you even use the word exorbitant uh, privilege, it sounds like it's all wonderful and positive, uh, but that's not necessarily the case. Even you're a country with the uh, uh, that that is viewed as the safe asset provider of the world. And that's a country that has what we call the classic Triffin dilemma that you can run into, which is that you're producing all these safe assets and running all these large deficits. Um, so when you, um, in terms of trade balance adjustment, there are limits to how much the US benefits from a weaker dollar, just the same way as other countries have limits to how much they can benefit from a weaker currency. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's not it's not uh, a, a kind of a win-win across the board. But that said, I do think there are strengths with being the reserve currency in a crisis. You less have to worry less about your current currency falling through and depreciating dramatically, uh, and you have many other benefits uh, from it. So uh, on Kathy's question uh, on. Trade relative to the GFC, I think that's a very important point. The, the, what we kind of showed you was the trade balance or the current account balance, which is the difference between exports and imports, and you have the income side. Uh, the question Kathy's asking, well, maybe also what's interesting is what has happening to global trade. So exports plus imports is the ratio of, of GDP. So we projected global trade to collapse by 12% in 2020. 
How does that compare to the uh, post GFC? It's slightly worse than, than the GFC. I think it was around 10, 10% then. We're projecting 12%. So it is worse. However, if you scale it by the size of the impact on the real economy, where the global financial crisis is now negative 4.9% contraction in global growth projected for 2020, as opposed to minus 0.1% in uh, 2008 or 9, uh, this is, relatively speaking, the collapse is much smaller. And what is the main source of the difference? The main source of the difference is that this time around, services, the collapse in services has played a very important role. Uh, and I'm talking about services, of course, the services of just tourism, which has an impact on trade. But there's many other kinds of services, which is restaurant meals, or, uh, people going to th movie theaters and things of that kind, which are non-traded. Uh, and you've seen a collapse in that activity and that doesn't show up in trade. Uh, going to the last point about um, uh, uh, that Daniel made, I, I agree with Daniel that external imbalances are not the number one concern at this point. Uh, in time of the crisis. However, I'm more closer to Kathy in being concerned about the trajectory of trade and trade protectionism uh, going forward. Uh, we have seen that show up with uh, certain kinds of uh, equipments and supplies. We are seeing countries now worried about breakdown in supply chains and, and not have, having shortages of certain kinds of material and trying to on source now, of course, that makes perfect sense to avoid uh, disruptions, but at the same time, uh, I can see that countries would start becoming much more inward looking and trying to be much more nationalistic. So I am concerned about uh, the future of uh, global trade. So with that, I will stop. Thank you for that. Um, let's turn to some questioners. Um, I'm beginning to get a bit mindful of time. So what I'm going to do is uh, ask the two uh, lead off questioners to pose their questions and then we'll come back. To, we'll come to the panel on both of them together. So um, uh, first, uh, let me uh, ask Rebecca Patterson, a longtime friend, an outstanding currency and investment analyst. Uh, she's a senior member of Bridgewater's investment uh, analytics team. Um, Rebecca, will you pose the first question? And for the second question, I'd like to hear from Prakash Kanan, the chief economist of Singapore's Government Investment Corporation and a former IMF staff economist in the research department. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And, and you know, I always look forward to new IMF research and I always gain insights from it. So I just wanna start by saying thank you for everything you do. It, it means a lot to the community. As for my question, one thing I think about with this pandemic related recession is that stating the obvious, we've seen extreme monetary and fiscal easing. And there seems a reasonable scenario where policymakers will just have to keep this stimulus going for some time unless they hit a policy constraint. And two of the constraints that are on my mind are currency devaluation and perhaps relatedly materially higher inflation. So. I wonder how are you thinking through those risk scenarios, uh, either significant FX weakness and or higher inflation as we look ahead. And if any countries stand out to you as particularly vulnerable on either of these attributes. Thank you. Prakash. So thanks Mark. Um, and, and once again, yeah, congratulations uh, uh, on the report. Uh, as Mark said, I used to be at the fund uh, more than 10 years ago now. And uh, I actually worked on earlier incarnations uh, of this report. So it's definitely evolved in a, in a much uh, better direction. Uh, my question um, uh, is, is the following. So you know, during this pandemic shock, um, most emerging markets have been able to cut interest rates uh, and allow their currencies to depreciate. Uh, which is which is a very different dynamic uh, than what we previously saw in other stress episodes. Uh, I mean, I realize I'm generalizing a bit here, but I was wondering if this whole episode uh, has made you uh, think about whether there are some e uh, emerging markets that have abandoned their uh, their old fear of floating uh, uh, issues, and um, for the remaining countries that have hard pegs, 
uh, what are the implications for them as, you know, at least on an uh, effective exchange rate basis, they'll be appreciating much more relative to their, uh, to their trading partners. Thank you for that. Uh, would Gita like to kick it off? And if Kathy or Daniel have any brief uh, remarks in addition, um, please. Um, sure, happy to. So just very quickly, uh, just working backwards in Prakash's question about the fear of floating. What the fear of floating did was force countries to take uh, appropriate actions to prevent the negative effects of exchange rates on their very large fluctuations of exchange rates on their economy. By that, I mean, if you look at what's happened over the last decade or so, you've seen emerging markets build up large FX reserves. So on net, many of them are now have bigger FX assets than they have liabilities, which is different from the past. And it was, it, you know, it was to, to insulate themselves from these kinds of exchange rate movements. Secondly, many of them switched to inflation targeting regimes and they've had much better success in disconnecting the, uh, the, it, uh, their consumer price inflation from exchange rate uh, movement to some extent. Now, it's not a, it doesn't happen all the time. There are some countries where you're seeing that the pass-through is still quite high. Uh, and there are countries that you do, you do see intervention, Turkey, Egypt, you're seeing FX reserves being used quite heavily, but it's not, uh, it's not across the board. I think part of the reason that countries have also moved very quickly to cut interest rates is because it's a global crisis and the reserve currency issuers of the world also cut interest rates. The tricky part is when you have the advanced economies not cutting interest rates and you have to, I think that's when these, uh, the fear of floating becomes an even bigger, bigger issue. Uh, on Rebecca's uh, questions about the concerns going forward, uh, Indeed, we have countries that are undertaking extraordinary policies. For the first time, we're seeing emerging markets do quantitative easing, which is not something we saw in previous crises. So there is the question of what does all of this imply for their currencies and for, the, for inflation. Again, as of now, given that every other country in the world is also keeping their interest rates very low. And so far, you've seen, if anything, in the most recent period, some correction of the depreciation that happened. What do we think about inflation? I think our projection is that given what we expect to be in terms of subdued demand going forward, which is weakness in business investment, as Kathy mentioned, but also higher household savings, that we think the pressure on inflation will remain, uh, will remain low. Now, there will be countries, especially if you're a country with weak institutions, weak credibility in terms of monetary policy and fiscal policy, in those countries, inflationary pressures are an, an important concern. So let me, in the interest of time, let me just stop here and, and, and add also see, I would like to see if Daniel, Daniel Lee, for instance, wants to bring uh, something in at some, uh, at some point. Thank you. Daniel Lee, do you have anything to add? Uh, thanks, I, I'm not right now. Kathy or Daniel Gross, do you have anything to add? Just uh, perhaps uh, one comment. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the countries uh, which go into this crisis with a strong external and fiscal position are the least likely to run into the uh, problems that uh, Rebecca mentioned. And that means that they should be shouldering the burden of the adjustment, so to speak, at least in the, in the short or medium run. And I think that is appropriate uh, for the global economy. Let me just come back uh, for a minute on the question of why doesn't everybody want to have a piece of the action of being a global currency? It really depends on what uh, policy <coughs> function your, uh, your country has. If the aim is to have as much, as pos as much consumption as possible at, uh, at cheap and interest rate, uh, then of course you want to have a global reserve currency. But uh, if your policy is uh, mainly aimed at keeping employment and exports up, then you're not so happy about having a global currency. And uh, I think uh, that is increasingly the case uh, for the uh, euro area. Remember, the euro area now is a very open economy, twice as open as 20 years ago. Uh, more open even than Germany was when there was some talk about the German mark becoming a global economy. And ask yourself, what would happen to Europe 
if, for example, China pegged to the euro instead of the dollar. Um, I don't think uh, that would be considered as a positive thing for most European policymakers. So while I acknowledge that some people in Brussels are thinking that it would be nice to have the euro performing as a global reserve currency, I think the actual impact for Europe would be mostly negative, at least in the sense of uh, not uh, fostering European growth, which is mainly based on exports these days. Let me just uh, make two comments, uh, one with regard to the emerging markets and their ability to use the interest rate uh, instrument to a much greater degree than they might have in the past. Um, that does come from central bank credibility that's been, been hard won. Uh, but one, one comment that I would make on that is uh, they're also able to cut because, it, because as Gita said, everybody else is cutting as well. Um, there is no prospect, uh, at least uh, think, thinking about it, uh, for any change in um, advanced economy uh, central bank uh, interest rate policy. But where there is a variation, and I think it is important, is that the yield curve in emerging markets is much steeper than the yield curve in advanced economies. In other words, uh, yield curve control, either actual or, or by guidance, uh, is much more effective in advanced economies than it is in emerging markets. And that does have implications for the duration of the debt that they are in the process of issuing. And that may be um, a problem going forward when, when the debt has to be rolled. Of course, it's fine now because interest service uh, is very low, but at some point in time, the shorter the duration of what you're issuing now in order to get the benefit of the very low short-term rates, that can come back to bite uh, in the future. And we know that, that uh, looking at the duration structure of, of external and domestic debt uh, is an important ingredient for figuring out um, prospects for sustainability for emerging markets. On inflation, I go with the, it's, it's, it's a micro market driven story about inflation. Um, can, is, are there tight labor markets that will all allow workers to get wage increases? I don't think so, uh, you know, or definitely not. And is this going to be a strong enough demand situation going forward that will give firms pricing power? And again, they don't seem to think so. So those two fundamental micro market fundamentals underpinning inflation dynamics going forward really are the dominant driver and sort of the Milton Friedman view of the world of credit growth being the driver of inflation going forward. Uh, I think that's pretty much was a 1950s to 1980s phenomenon and has not been a feature of the inflation prospect, uh, you know, inflation dynamics in, in more recent decades. Well, thank you for that. So I'm very mindful of time. We've probably gone a minute or two beyond, but we do have an audience. So uh, may I ask one question from the audience uh, and then we will wrap up. Um, so Jean-Francois Perrault is chief economist at Canada Scotiabank, but he formerly used to negotiate uh, G20 communiques with me. And he was one of the creators and chairs of the G20 framework working group. Um, and he asks, a key function of the ESRs has been to frame external imbalances in a global context in order to help identify the scope for individual or collaborative action to reduce problematic imbalances. That, of course, assumes that international policymakers are open to the benefits that flow from cooperative and coordinated action. It seems clear that we are no longer in a world where there is much of that spirit left, he says. What do you think it will take to rekindle a more cooperative approach to global challenges? And how might the ESR evolve to facilitate that? Would there be scope, for example, to more explicitly link imbalances to the challenge of inequality? I, I guess I answer that, uh, Mark. <laughs> it's only yes, sir. Yes. Uh, now, thank you. I think I think we are in the high noon of skepticism on uh, on global cooperation. I think that's a that's a fair uh, assessment. This, these are these are certainly uh, challenging times. Now, you know, maybe one can be a little bit uh, you know glass half full by talking about some things that have happened recently, which are good signs. You know, the G20 initiative for debt service relief, I think, is a very important step in that direction. Uh, 
I think central banks around the world and the swap lines they've provided uh, have began spoken very well to the global um, uh, global you know what kind of the global outlook. Uh, the you know the work that we're doing at the IMF I think is 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 hugely important with our 189 member countries support. So there is there, but yes, indeed, it is a challenge in terms of uh, uh, cooperation. But uh, I think the it is this is even for every individual country's benefit. It is important to have a stable international financial system, uh, one where you are not seeing countries that entering into deep crises. It matters not just for the country itself, but it matters for the world as a whole. So I do think that from even from a narrow personal interest, it's very important to ensure uh, that uh, the global economy stays on a stable footing. And these imbalances, especially when they're very large in some countries, can, uh, can undermine that. And so I would hope that there would be that focus would remain. I think the ESR plays that important role provides a very holistic approach, makes it multilaterally consistent. It's not about bilateral imbalances. Uh, and uh, I think it gives you the right perspective on how to deal with it. Well, thank you. Uh, and those are perfect words uh, on which to end today's uh, discussion. Uh, thank you. Thanks for a wonderful report and a fantastic presentation. Thanks to uh, all the panelists who joined us today. Thank you to the audience. And uh, I particularly congratulate you and Daniel Lee on a uh, wonderful ESR this year. Thank you for joining us today. It's been our honor to host you. Thank you, Mark. It's totally been a pleasure too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.